Hey, you guys, it's Lacey and Alexander, and we are doing the synthesis. Welcome back today and next week. Actually, we are going to be talking about The Martian, the movie yes. instead of the book, which we've been doing for weeks. Yep, it is exciting to move into a new medium. So this week we're going to be talking about the film as a film. We're just going to be sort of responding to it the way we would if there was no book. Uh, we are also going to be talking about how it compares to the book. And then next week, we're going to dive into more of the sort of nitty gritty details of the science and the production. We're only going to, we're going to be talking about the movie as if there was no book, but we're also going to be comparing it to the book is exactly how he put it. <laughs> so next week, we're going to be getting into the production details and the science details and uh, all that sort of uh, more, more nitty gritty stuff. Yes. So... Let's be like the movie and just jump right into the story. I know, right? Yes. Which is the first point of distinction between the movie <laughs> yes. and the book is we pick up in real time. We don't flash back to the Ares 3 crew. Uh -huh. We pick up and they are doing their thing. And, and you've got Martinez and Watney just like joshing around. They are mm -hmm. obviously the class clowns. Yes. This is, it's like, it's one of those things where it's funny for the audience, but I imagine that for the rest of the crew, it's a little obnoxious because like <laughs> I was always that, I was always that person that I could handle the class clowns for a good while and then I'd get really annoyed. I feel like, so so quite clearly you are Commander Lewis on this on this crew. There's, there's is, no- Is it because I'm the redhead? It, well, that's part of it, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but no, I, I really, I feel like the Ares 3 crew sort of breaks into three neat groups. Okay. There's Watney and Martinez are the class clowns. Yes. And then Beck and Johansson are the ones who sort of wish that they could be the class clowns, who like laugh at the class clowns, but can't actually keep up with the jokes as much. Okay. And then Lewis and Vogel are the ones that are like, would you shut up? We're trying to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite things right off the top is when Lewis apologizes to Vogel for her countrymen. Yeah. And I was just like. And he accepts her apology. Yes. Like there's like, it's not, oh, don't worry. I think it's funny. He's uh -huh. like, yes, it's, it's fine. Like, <laughs> I, and which, you know, this whole sequence just does an incredibly good job of establishing the characters and their camaraderie. Like, yeah. I feel like you're 30 seconds into the movie and you get the Ares 3 crew. You do. I, I will say, just a little off topic, I, I would love to see more female class clowns just yeah. in the world. So if anybody is out there writing something, just consider it. I don't, yeah. you don't see them very often. I think if I there think are any female students out in the audience, what she's saying is you have Edgeworks Entertainment's permission <laughs> to get on your teacher's nerves. <laughs> that's no, no, it's di that's different yeah. to make your classmates laugh uh, and get on your teacher's nerves. Yes. Okay. It's great. It's not an or, so, it's an and. No, yes. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, but I will say, so then they turn off the radio, um, which this is a little bit, yeah. you know, this is a little bit different from what happens in the book, but uh, Johansson is like jokingly turns off Martinez's and yeah. Martin's radio. Yeah. Well, she she says I can do that, and Lewis is like, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yes, I get it. I uh, yeah. I I get it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the um. Yeah. Uh, oh, Iman Economist asks if Lacey is uh, Commander Lewis, then which one is Alex? Oh God. Probably Beck. Yeah. Why? Because like he's super smart and capable and And he gets the girl. <laughs> he does get the girl. Yeah. But you're just not the class clown. Yeah. And you're also not Vogel. Yeah. You're Vogel's a little too Yeah. I'll take back. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. I'm he's not the most inter he's not as interesting as Lewis, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, so pretty quickly, because we're we're moving right along through this movie, uh, the storm happens. Mm -hmm. And as in the book, this is uh, unrealistic. This is not a storm that could possibly exist on Mars. There's just not enough air. We've already been over this. But it was spectacular. You know, this sequence in the in the movie, I thought, did an incredibly good job of establishing a scary storm. Like, this goes from everybody laughing and joking yeah. to, whoa, scary, really fast. And the music, everything really builds the tension. Well, and one of the other things is, and I did not expect this, is that Watney pressures Lewis to not leave. Yeah. And 
like right at the beginning of the storm when they're talking about okay we have to go into emergency procedures or whatever and we see Watney talking back and pressuring and I I wasn't in love with this choice because we don't see this happen anywhere in the book mm -hmm. you know in, in the book, the first thing that we see with the storm is Watney go, being the solution guy. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, well, if we do this, which then. Which you, you could argue is roughly the same. He's, he's trying to figure out ways for them to stay on Mars. He's the voice of, we don't have to leave yet. We can fix this. We can stay. Um, and, you, you know, that, that moment in the movie where he says, Commander Lewis, please, let's, let's not abort that's not in the book, but I feel like it's in, in the same spirit of what he did in the book of trying to find a way for them to not abort. Yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of disagree. I feel yeah. like he was too pushy for that. This is why you don't make the class clown a leader. Mm, fair Just enough. putting it out there. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't in love with the, the moment because to me it felt too much. Uh, it was it was too much second guessing. It didn't yeah. feel like solution making. Um, you know, there is actually, al although, you know, Giving, giving Watney his credit, uh, I don't think it's fair to categorize it as second guessing because she hadn't made a decision yet. He was advocating his position, but as soon as she says we're scrubbed, he got, he got to work just like everybody else. I don't else. know. I felt, it felt Which, aggressive to me. Really? Or it was like, aggressive's not exactly the right word, but there's something about uh, aggressive or uh, pushy, kind of uh, not whining because that, that has a certain like yeah. tone, but like the... Pleading. What? Pleading. Yeah, questioning her yeah. and that I didn't think was appropriate to his character. Yeah, I feel, I mean, I definitely got a sense that he was pleading to stay. Like, he was definitely making a case with passion. Um, but I feel like I, I never got the sense that he was going against her. She, when he was making that case, she was still crossed arms, thinking about options. And technically, they were beyond the level at which she should abort but she hadn't said we're going to yet. So I think he was he was making he was advocating for what he wanted, but when she said abort, right. he went for it. Well, I mean, um, yeah. There okay. is uh, an interesting thing that we haven't actually discussed, I think, in this entire show about the Martian, which just occurred to me, which is in the end, well, no, I guess the Mav would have tipped if they had stayed. Yes. It, what, what I was thinking was the Hab wasn't destroyed. They could have stayed in the Hab and they would have been fine, except no, because the no, Mav the would Mav have tipped. No, the Mav totally would have tipped. Yeah. Because the only reason the Mav didn't tip is because of Martinez. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. Okay. So. Um, I did notice an interesting thing about the storm as it is portrayed in the movie and also sort of in the book, but especially in the movie, which is that it was a surprisingly not spacey s sequence. Like usually... Well, usually in things like gravity, when they want to play up how scary space is, it's all about like running out of air and like your hose gets ripped out. And, you know, you, you can look at sequences in the expanse where there are sequences where there are scenes, you know, in a battle where someone's air hose gets ripped out and they're like running out of air and all that kind of stuff. The sequence in the storm could have happened on Earth. Like they were all in spacesuits, but that's that scene would have played out exactly the same way if they had been uh, on, like in a hurricane in Louisiana, you know? It wasn't a particularly spacey, terrifying oh, see, sequence. You, it the, was just a scary storm. The emergency was a, a rather normal emergency as compared right. to a sp space specific emergency. Exactly, that, right. like it's not like a meteor storm or you know, a gamma cloud or anything, like it's just a storm. It's, it's something that they could have uh, experienced anywhere. And I think that the way that it's framed in the movie is interesting in how that plays out. Right. You know? Um, I was a lot less annoyed with Lewis for looking, uh, for Watney. Yeah. And I don't know why I, I can't decide it's if I think it must be because everybody knows the stakes here, mm -hmm. but we're not, you know, it was pages of mm -hmm. her, looking for him and i don't mean like 10 pages yeah, but like two or three but it it's was still two or three which takes a little while well it takes longer to read it yeah. than to watch it and they couldn't have dragged it out a right. whole lot longer but it didn't feel as long mm -hmm. so i think that i don't know there was something about it where i wasn't upset with lewis and now that might be because of how i know the story ends because right. of the book and a, the a lot of the leeway that I gave, you know, like when you learn, 
you know when you like don't like somebody or you don't like the decisions they make and then you learn something new about them and you like you sort of can't hate them anymore yeah Yeah. well like you kind of forgive everything that they've done because you're like Oh, uh, I, I get it. You're yeah. actually like a fully fleshed human being. Yeah, you're not and just a villain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's kind of how I feel. I mean, without her being an actual villain, right. that's kind of how I feel about her is yeah. I now that I see the amount of work she does mm-hmm. by the end to save him, yeah. that helps me feel better about the fact that she put the rest of her team in jeopardy up front. Yeah. So it was a nice journey. It also seeing it in a, in a movie really underlines the chaos yeah. that like it's it's easy to sort of you know say oh she should have stuck to protocol when you're reading it at your own pace whereas when you're watching it in a movie and there's like dust swirling around and everybody's kind of shouting over each other and she's you know she's still sort of like right next to the map she can go back whenever she wants it's not like she's a long way away but at the same time she really wants to go find you know mark and all this stuff it 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 makes it a lot more sort of palpable and you kind of lose the ability to say you would have done otherwise. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I will say that uh, Johansson, now, okay, hold on. Yeah. Johansson or Johansson? We've been saying Johansson from the book, but in the movie, I'm pretty sure they say Johansson. Okay, so. fine. Um, so Johansson looking at Watney's seat that's empty yeah. is the first moment that it really hits that, oh shit, he's gone. Yeah. And it's, it's just interesting to see two different mediums and how that moment, how those moments differ. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't get that moment. Not really. I think we, we know that Johansson cries. Yeah. In the, yeah in, gently sobbing, I think. Is, yeah. yeah. And I remember that like really getting to me. Yeah. But then in the movie, she doesn't gently cry. She just has this moment of, Oh my God! Yeah. You know that happens. Sort of sh- thousand yard stare. Yeah, and I I equally loved it, and it's the first time that we're really getting the full. Hey guys, my phone is on. Sorry about that. Um, it's the first time we get that uh, that like that hit yeah. of how it feels. In it's in a similar vein, there's a line that I really like from the book and it made it into the movie and it was delivered perfectly and it could have not been. Um, It's from Beck and it's when he tells Commander Lewis, listen, I know you don't wanna hear this, but Mark is dead. You need to come in and we need to go. And Martinez sort of whirls on him and goes, man, what the hell are you doing? Or, you know, what are are you doing? Um, And Beck's response is, my best friend just, or my friend just died. I don't want my commander to die too. And that is something that I've heard referred to before as an actor-dependent line. Like that, in, in the hands of another actor, that could have been a really bad line. But it was such a good line because he delivered it with professionalism. Yeah. It wasn't, he didn't turn it into sort of a testosterone, like, don't question me kind of thing. It was, I'm trying to be rational. Lewis isn't being rational. We have to face facts. Let's go. Yeah. You can tell that this is this is one of those kids that's like the straight A takes all the AP classes kind of kid because mm-hmm. to me that's what like that's like a personality um facet yeah. of a lot of those people where it's like you just start to get that we we have we have things to do. Yeah. And it's not that I am being emotionally bereft yeah. or something like that, you know? Yeah, but he's um, not being cold. He's also yeah. the doctor, so he's sort of the one who's used to calling it. You yeah, know? yeah. Then um, we go on to NASA. Yeah. And we get Jeff Daniels, who... Perfect. Oh, my God. Jeff Daniels as Teddy, who heads up NASA, right? Well, he's the director of... Is he the director of NASA? Yeah, yeah okay. He can do any part whenever he wants like i'm pretty sure that hollywood can cast him forever and i will he's one of the only people that i would accept hollywood being like hey uh we know he's dead but we're just going to recreate him forever please do (laughs) because you just want infinite jeff daniels yes absolutely otherwise i'm like no give other artists a chance like Mm -hmm. there are other talented people we don't need to see audrey hepburn up there for the rest of everybody's lives. But Jeff Daniels is an exception to that rule. Yeah. 
yeah, he just exudes command. Like he's that he's so perfect in this role because he's never sort of loud. He never gets in anybody's face, but he just owns every room he walks into. He's yes. in charge and nobody ever doubts that. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I, I, I'm going to say that about a bunch of the actors in yes. this movie because they, they have such an extraordinary cast. It's, it's, it's kind of weird how extraordinary it is because it's definitely, you know, Matt Damon is the lead, but otherwise it's, an ensemble yeah. piece and when since when has jessica chastain not been front and center you know mm. you've got all of these people that are just phenomenal so anyway mm -hmm. uh i will be saying it a lot because i could watch a lot of these actors forever yeah um so yeah. then we get back to mars uh -huh. and matt damon does an incredible job of portraying pain yeah. We've got a long sequence. He tries to stand up while he's still impaled and he lets out this shriek that is utterly just believable. Well, and, and then he scream he he does this sort of quick breathing thing and then he rips the piece out of his side when he gets inside. He's covered in cold sweat and pale and shaking and like just the so whole sequence. A couple of things are a little bit different. It he was impaled by something that was attached to its its original piece yeah. like whatever that communication satellite was or whatever yeah and that's different from the book and so which i thought was really interesting because to me uh if you're gonna if you're still attached to the satellite you probably did a lot more damage to your body maybe um it so might also explain why he went flying that he didn't just get knocked he got pulled right. yeah i mean that's true um yeah. but did it seem like watney was out longer in the movie than he was in the book like i mean we only see a short part of it but i think that I, I don't think there's any reason to think that that is actually true but that impression comes across because we cut away we cut to earth and then we cut back and he yeah. wakes up so well, it sort of implies that he was there for you know a day and i suppose that it it feels like we we went from night to day and we didn't yeah. it's it was daytime the, the dust storm, storm hits yeah it gets really dark because of the dust storm, and then we wake up yeah. to it having passed, and it's bright outside again. So but it's just later that afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Um, um, so we get to the Hab, which is interesting. Uh, this is one of those subtle things that differs from the book because this Hab is definitely a building, not a tent. This is yeah. not. A, this is not a structure made of canvas. No. Um, this well, is. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Before we go to that, okay. I just want to say. I missed, like, I, I will struggle. Like, I loved this movie mm -hmm. up front. I had not read the book um, until this read through with you guys, but I loved the movie. <laughs> and then this time, after reading the book, I don't love the movie as much. And it kind of, uh, it kind of bums that's, me yeah, out. Yeah, that's a bummer. Because, and it's, it's not because of the, the acting or anything like that. No, no, no. Or the directing. It's purely because I love Andy Weir's writing so much. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the, they have to find different ways to up the stakes of the story. They have to, they have to play with different events to make things feel real to the audience or, you know, whatever. But, you know, I feel like that's probably why they attached um, whatever impaled him to the satellite. It's another way to up the stakes. So there's that. Um, but we're not, the big thing for me is we're losing a lot of the science. Yeah. We don't get to hear about his suit back, what, it, what, is it, what does he call it when uh, it like pressurizes with nitrogen? It, he says it- Backfilling. Backfilling. Yeah. Like we don't get all of the alarms and stuff like that. And we don't get his thought processes. And so, I, that's going to be something that I tr I'm not gonna I'm gonna try not to harp on it too much, because, yeah. you know, we all know that that's how this is going to be. We're not going to be in his head, but part of the problem with that is we don't get to see him dealing with it. We don't get to see him later being a solution maker, any of that because. Yeah, the movie is definitely yeah. still a celebration of science and of capability, but 
one of the first things that Lacey and I sort of noticed when we finished watching the movie was that this is a movie about someone implementing solutions, whereas the book is the story of someone coming up with solutions. And that is a fine distinction, but an important distinction. And it is kind of a shame. You know, you never actually see Watney pretty much at any point in the movie figuring out how to fix this. He just turns on the GoPro and says, this is what I'm doing. Or, and sometimes he succeeded, sometimes he fails. Like he does blow himself up like in the book, but he's never doing the math. He's never, you know, I think, I think, I guess the one time in the movie that we do see that is the hexadecimal sequence. We see him coming up with how are we going to communicate um, with this camera. But in the meantime, we get this great moment where Damon comes into the airlock. This is when he's been hit. Yeah. He's hurt. He's going to deal with all of this stuff. We get to watch him do surgery on himself. Yeah. Boo, oof. so gross. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not the goriest thing I've ever seen or anything like that, but it's still like... Yeah, I actually, I really like the restraint. I feel like mm-hmm. that scene does a really good job of portraying, this is a situation that sucks. He is in pain. He is bleeding. This is awful. But... It's also not a Tarantino film. Like, yeah, he's bleeding a little. Like, he's yeah. gonna, you know, he and needs to... he's in to, a lot of pain. Yeah, he's in a lot of pain, but he's not, like, passing out every two seconds. You know, like, this is an amount of pain that you could handle. He's, he's essentially been shot with an arrow, and that sucks. But, you know, people who have been shot with arrows can, like, walk to go get help. He's yeah. not just knocked on his ass. He's, yeah. he's handling it. So, when he comes in through that airlock and he starts taking off his suit because he has to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Damon has some pretty sexy arms, you guys. I'm yeah, just, that guy's strong. Ooh. Like, we don't see it. Ki- like, you know, that declines over the rest of the movie. Yeah. This is the moment where we're supposed to see sexy Matt Damon. It's right off the top. And yeah. then they kind of let that go through the rest of the movie. You only need the one shot of the yeah, the, the ac- yeah the action hero yeah. um, shot. You only need it once in every movie. Thank God for those actors, mm-hmm. but this is this is where we get it, and I'm super into his arms. It uh, is also, uh, it's something that I was wondering is, I wonder if he beefed up for The Martian just to get the contrast of strong Mark to emaciated Mark, mm-hmm. or if that's just Matt Damon's physique. Like, I wonder if they just ca- cast Matt Damon, and that's where he keeps himself as, a, as an actor, and so that's what he looks like. Right. Or if he went out of his way to be strong at the beginning of this movie, and then they they phased him into it, emaciated later. Well, I mean, there we'll get to that. Yeah. I have I have some thoughts on it, but um, he, one, one of the w- the first word he says yeah. after being left is fuck. Yeah, and Which, it's who can blame the man? Right, right, right. <laughs> I, the thing is, is it's like that first instance that we really get into his personality of him alone. Yes. Which yeah. I. I'm, I, that is going to also be something that I try not to harp on too much, mm-hmm. which the, the writers are definitely trying to give us his personality. And yeah. this is one of the ways is the profanity. Yeah. Um, there is one very important distinction between yeah. the book and the uh, movie that happens here. Not terribly consequential, but it does bear mentioning. Uh, he's doing vlogs. Yeah. He's not writing. Uh, in the book, we are told very specifically that these are written journals. He he mentions, for example, when he rolls the rover, he says, I'm reaching up to the keyboard to type this. Um, and, you know, this was probably the easiest choice in the history of cinema. He's not going to be writing. He's going to be talking to the camera because, of course, he is. Well, but, and yeah. they don't want to do voiceovers the entire time. Right. I mean, it's one of the rules of of writing a script is... You want to keep those voiceovers to a minimum, and yeah. if you're going to use them, you better use them better than other people have. Yes. Uh, they're often considered a cliche, and they, I mean, that's the way they come across. It's not just script writers being yeah. jerks to each other. It truly often doesn't work. So they do this, the video logs, but th- did you notice the interesting, like, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if you want to call it pixelation. It's more like a... Uh, oh, the a jump pattern. Cuts? No, no, no. The pattern filter that they put over his video blogs mm-hmm. um, versus the film itself. Yes, they definitely distinguish. It's, these are two different mediums that we're watching. Yeah. yeah. And it was kind of weird because um, that's not how GoPros look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Although this is the 2030s. Maybe it will be. 
I mean, it could be, but it's not as, yeah. it's, it's like, it's not as good, yeah. you know? <laughs> so I, but I mean, I get it. They have mm. to, they have to find a way to differentiate yeah. and make it look like he's not just looking straight into the camera. Uh, Cause that would get real like fourth wall weird. And that's not the, he, the thing he's not doing is breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he is looking straight into the camera, but it's not breaking the fourth wall. He is looking not, into a camera. He's not talking to us. He's talking to his Earth audience. Yeah. And that's, as as much as we are all on Earth, that's not us. Yep. Uh, um, by the way, interesting acting challenge. Like, I don't know how many of the of the people watching this or listening to this are actors, but I've done enough acting to know that it's not the easiest thing in the world to just sit at a desk and act a scene. Like, with no other actors, with no uh, anything, he has to convey a whole range of emotions without reacting to anything. It's all coming from him. and um, he does Without reacting job. to other people. I mean, he's yeah. got plenty to react to. For well, some... I, ju I just mean in the scene. Like, yeah. he's, he's got story, bo story beats to react to, but in the shot, it's just him sitting at a desk. And There's nothing happening. I will admit that that actually can be super hard, mm -hmm. but I think this is a little bit easier because the, the point isn't that he's... The, the, how, how do I put this? The, the point is specifically that he is talking to someone. He just doesn't know who it is. Mm -hmm. Which helps, yeah. um, but not a whole lot. I mean, yeah. you're right. It just doesn't, um, it's not quite the same, I think. Um, there is a line right here uh, at this point in the film that is a flub of Matt Damon's. I am 99% sure that this was not a mistake in the script. This was a mistake of Matt's. Uh, and that is because I remember this line because it didn't make sense in the movie and I keep w I've watched the movie so many times and every time I always bump on this line and so when we were reading it I watched out for it and in the book it's correct so I have a feeling that Matt Damon just memorized it wrong and that is he's talking about all the different ways that he could die he could run out of food uh, the oxygenator could break and then he says if the hab breaches I'm just gonna kind of implode and in the book it says explode because wow. if he were underwater, he would implode because the rushing water would crush him. But on Mars, the lack of atmosphere, that hab is going to explode outward. He, his body, he wouldn't actually explode in like a, you know, Halloween movie sense, but the pressure would be going out, not in. So the word would be explode like in the book rather than implode, which is what he says in the film. Well, yeah. Um, also here he says, I'm not going to die here. Yeah, I which... made a note of that. That I is not a beat that we get in the book. No. And I, I love that he, uh, that we see him say that because, again, we're getting so little of his personality because, A, the vlogs are just, uh, at least to start with, don't show off his personality the way that the logs in the book did. Mm -hmm. And so by saying, I'm not going to die here, we learn kind of like a lot about this guy. Mm -hmm. He's... He is determined, he's optimistic, he is uh, setting a goal for himself. Like, I feel like there's a lot to be said in that line. And he's confident. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not just, I don't want to die here. It's a declarative statement. I'm not going to yeah. die here. This isn't going to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, in the book, this moment does happen, but it happens between chapters. If you remember, chapter one starts with, I'm fucked. That's my carefully considered opinion, fucked. And it ends with, I'm really fucked. And then the next chapter starts and he goes, okay, so I had, so I had a ni good night's sleep and I had some food and things aren't looking as bad. And he goes off. So clearly he had that moment of shifting from fatalism to hope. Yeah. But it's so great to actually see it in, on screen. That, yeah. is a, that is a beat that is and good to have. I, I wish that they had kept some of those lines, like mm -hmm. that, that very first line that you just said that we get of the uh, I'm fucked. Yeah, um, that's my carefully considered opinion. Yeah, that yeah. I wish that that stuff that that, that they had brought mm -hmm. a little bit more of those lines into mm -hmm. the vlogs, because this is this is one area where you and I disagree. I feel like they do capture Mark's personality. Uh -huh. We don't get as much of it, but it I think they do a really good job of capturing the same character. There's so there's a there's sort of a an ongoing conversation among anybody who gets really into movies, which is, do deleted scenes count? Like, no. when, you, when you cut a scene from the movie, did that scene happen? 
in the story. Like, not, not does it count as part of the film, but like, if there was a scene where Mark, you know, did something, and then they cut it from the film, did that happen in the story? And some people think, yes, that it wasn't portrayed, but, you know, it still happened. And some people say, no, if it's not in the film, it didn't happen. Um, another, a great example of this, for me as a Lord of the Rings fan, is Tom Bombadil. So Tom Bombadil is a beloved character from Lord of the Rings, the book. He does not appear in the movie, and everybody was really sad. But they didn't change anything. Frodo and Sam could still have met Tom Bombadil in The Fellowship of the Ring, the film. It's just not portrayed. There's nothing in the film that says that that couldn't have happened. Okay, so And so that... what I feel about Mark Watney is we don't get a lot of the lines in the book that show his personality, but they didn't change his personality. Like, mm -hmm. they, it, he is still the same character. We just don't get as much of it because it's only two hours instead of the whole okay. book. I feel like it's, okay, I need you to back me up here. Essentially what I'm saying is, take my side but but seriously i want to know who you guys agree with because i really like mark watney's character in the movie mm -hmm. i just feel like it's a muted version of what we get in the books yeah because he's just so much funnier in but see he has those moments you know the very next note that i have here uh, about the movie is mars will come to fear my botany powers like he has those moments that are his character he just doesn't have pages and pages and pages and pages of monologue the way he does in the book to pepper them in. Uh, but I think that you can, there's, an, there's like a economy that you work within when you're writing, which is like, I, I have this many words that I can put mm. into the scene before the timing and the pacing of the scene no longer works. Mm. And you, okay, like it's not, obviously it's not a specific number, but go with me here. You've got, an economy of words and you have to put the words together to to give as much meaning and to give as much personality specificity specificity as possible and i feel like that was just a little bit off here hmm. and i feel like they got the story that's true they they just didn't capture quite as much of uh watney's optimism because we see a lot of his like his uh fun and his the reason we talk about it in the book the reason that you see mark watney here and not martinez or or beck or somebody else is because watney is the guy who can mentally handle this mm -hmm. and, and that's the character we want to see go through it you know we don't want us to just see someone die sadly mm -hmm. because it got overwhelming we want to see the guy who can manage it who can who can keep his head above water and we're not like this guy isn't specific enough as as, as specific as the guy in the book yeah to me just to me that's fair i i still like watney this is not me getting down on matt mm -hmm. damon's performance it's not even me totally getting down on the writers a little bit but um i really feel like they could have used a lot of a lot of the dialogue yeah. a little bit better to show him off i i yeah. will leave it there this is I, I think this is one thing that you and i are just going to <laughs> differ on um that being said uh you know he he gets to work and we pretty quickly move into you know what is pretty undeniably the most famous sequence of the martian the book and the film which is uh making water and planting potatoes and we come to one of just a few um, changes for the worse, Cha like actual straight up mistakes, straight okay. up things that they didn't do right in the movie, Okay. Uh, which is Mark's explosion. Mark Watney blows himself up in both the book and the movie, but yeah. it doesn't make sense in the movie. They changed the story so that the reason he blew himself up is no longer a thing. Okay, so, you're going to have to explain that. Yeah, so in the book, when he's making water, what he accidentally does is he realizes he's been releasing a massive amount of hydrogen into the atmosphere. And so he sort of looks around and realizes, I'm in a bomb. And the whole chapter starts when he's in the rover because he's freaking out because if he goes back into the airlock, a single static shot could blow up the whole hab. What he ultimately realizes is he can remove all the oxygen from the hab, and 
start slowly burning it off by releasing little bits of oxygen into the hab and burning it, and the hydrogen will burn with the oxygen, but then it will use up the oxygen and it'll stop because you can't have an explosion without oxygen. And so he does that, and he's, it's starting to work, and then all of a sudden the whole hab kind of blows up. Like, it doesn't pop, but it blows up. And his explanation after the fact is he's wearing an oxygen mask, and he wasn't accounting for the oxygen that he was breathing out. That right. he, he had a little oxygen tank that he was releasing and burning, but he was also pouring oxygen into the room from his face. Right. But that only makes sense if he had removed all the oxygen from the room. And what happens in the movie is he's just making, he's just making water from hydrogen in a room filled with oxygen. Yeah. And then it blows up and he says, oh, I forgot to account for the oxygen I was exhaling. And it's like, you were exhaling the room. Like, the, the, you weren't adding anything to the room. The, the oxygen was already in the room. Right. So that's, As that's one area. As a matter of fact, area. you're like, you are breathing in, you're breathing in the air and you're yeah. releasing more Car carbon yeah. dioxide. Yeah, you're, you're a net negative into this system, yeah. not a net positive. <laughs> that's so true. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that only the deep nerds are going to care about, but it is funny that they, they sort of, they kept the story beat, but they changed the science and now the story beat doesn't make sense. Right. I, the so. thing that I didn't like is that when we go to the vlog, he's still smoking. Oh, really? I loved that. Oh, that annoyed that. me. I was like, this is going just on. Just a little bit. Like, he's not hes not like a Muppet, but he's, there's little wisps it, of smoke. Yeah, it just felt... Yeah, it, a it, little much. It felt a little much. Yeah. And it, it felt like uh, they're leaning on physical comedy yeah. in a way that I didn't think was necessary in that moment. Um, but, you know, whatever. Uh, the the other thing that we see here as he's putting together the potato farm is we see that the uh, the packets of uh, human waste yep. they are, are cataloged <laughs> and analyzed. Oh, uh, my God. It's yeah. so weird. Oh, yeah. Why? <laughs> like, no, seriously. Why? It's he, they weren't going to get back in there. They weren't going to get into those containers. That wasn't a they part could. of their mission. Yeah, they could. There are plenty of reasons to do that. I mean, first of all, so I only noticed it on this watch through, but it, 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 it doesn't just label them. When he, when he uses the toilet, he reaches over and touches a panel, and when he touches what is effectively the flush button, the, the screen flashes up, and it does a medical analysis. So it's, it's not can just... can do it that fast, seriously. Yeah. You know, takes a sample, packages the rest, and starts processing the sample. Um, Gross. so that is part of it is it's, it's not just packaging it up. It's also analyzing it for any kind of danger signs. Um, but the other reason, you know, remember they are only the third group of people to ever land on Mars. And so there are any number of reasons why you might want to go back, you know, for example, let's find out, let's, let's say that maybe, uh, something in the Martian atmosphere starts causing liver failure and they, you know, one of, one of the one of the crew starts getting really sick or something like that. Maybe the, the fines, the Martian dust, get into their lungs and it starts causing problems. You might want to go back and check what is effectively a stool sample archive and see when did those symptoms first start showing up. I will tell you that my husband is, a, is the very best at doing exactly what you just saw, <laughs> which is it's someone, a skill point, of mine. It, 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 someone points out either a flaw or a weird detail that you plot don't hole. Uh, plot hole whatever yeah. and it kind of drive i had to learn how to get used to it it <laughs> drives a lot of our friends crazy it's true because he's not the guy that you watch bad movies with he doesn't want to hate movies no 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 he doesn't want there to be plot holes so he'll fill them in for like yeah. he's the director's favorite kind of audience because if the director screws up this guy's gonna help him out i will Just fill in any gap if there if there is a reason why something doesn't make sense i will point out why well i mean it could make sense like they did this two scenes ago and so now they're doing this it makes so, perfect sense so long as so long yeah. as the director has gotten alex on his side yeah. that's gonna happen yeah. there are a couple of directors out there that alex is not going to put in the effort no. but <laughs> so it's not for yeah. everybody but yeah um, most mostly i don't like not liking movies right like so I yeah. just, just putting that out there, I don't do that as much. I mean, unless I super love the movie, I, I feel like, you know, I was the person who was, um, 
I really did that for the Harley Quinn movie. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. I was, I yeah. loved it. Bird, I'm here Birds for of it. Prey, you yeah. defended the hell out of it. I did. Yeah. I really did. Um, don't start with me. Um, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, this is the moment where we have to take a moment to appreciate Harry Gregson Williams' score for The Martian. This is one of my favorite movie scores of all time, and oh. this is coming from a guy who listens to basically nothing but movie scores. So, it's a big deal, guys. Yeah. Uh, Harry Gregson Williams' score for The Martian, I have probably listened to two or three hundred times, like just on repeat. Um, I, this is why I make him wear headphones. Yes, yes. Uh, I will often start on the song Making Water, which is, I think, the third song in the album, and it, I'll just set it on repeat. It's great music to work to. It's very sort of like quietly upbeat. It's not going to... It's not going to wear you out, but it still, you know, makes you want to work. Uh, also, this is all I'll say because Lacey is already rolling her eyes at me. <laughs> but one more thing I will say is if you ever go read Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, listen to the soundtrack to The Martian as you do it. They pair perfectly. They are exactly the same vibe of sort of beautiful and fascinating and majestic, but also lonesome and solitary. I will say that on long uh, drives like when we yes. drive cross country or something the Martian is definitely on pretty frequently and uh, I I enjoy it too it's like it's a good thinking music yeah and uh, if we can just get a, a little bit of reaction from the audience Jay Patel has weighed in and said this is Jay Grape has weighed in and said that he too basically only listens to movie scores Which and means I've got and I've just, no I've got I've got to say I think you need to stop giving Jay Grape such a hard time okay oh like my God. I just, I, he's, he's one of our dedicated listeners. I think you just need to stop hating on Jay Grape. Quite, he, Jay Grape is good people. Like, listen, he's got good taste in music. I think you just need to, to get off Jay Grape's case. Um, anyway, so back on right. Earth. Oh, my uh, God. We <laughs> you are in so much trouble. Listen. <laughs> I, no, you know what? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. It, we, um, All right. Lacey's going to go away. I'm going to finish this episode and we'll, she'll be back next week. I hope <laughs> uh, um, he won't be. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we uh, we then we finally cut back to Earth. And I've just got to say, uh, I'm not sure that Lacey is with me. Oh, we have missed a thing. something. Oh, we have a thing. You guys, we missed something. <gasps> we yes. we want to um, talk about Johansson's poop or very odiferous poop. What? I'm going to murder you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was. Shh, don't say that out loud. Um, the uh, the crops we get to see. Oh yeah. The moment that well, it's the first time you see green in the movie. Yeah. And uh, I mean seriously, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk more about the coloring of this movie yeah. at another time. But uh, this movie is bookended by green by plants tiny little sprouts yes yeah. and so i just it to me i think it's a really important thing because i mean a it's important to him mm -hmm. um but uh seeing that green i was i was a little shook yeah this this movie is overwhelmingly orange white and blue yeah. those are the colors of this movie uh -huh. and then that shock of green is which is funny because like you don't think of a shock of something as ever being green. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess maybe if you live in a desert, maybe yeah. you might, but. Yeah. Coming, coming up over the dune and seeing an oasis I guess is probably a shock of green. Iman Economist, tell us, like living in, what, it's Western Australia, right? Like there, there are some major, I mean, ochre is, I think of ochre when I think of Australia, specifically because of a book that talks about colors and uh, what they mean to different groups and the dreaming and all of that stuff. So tell me, I want to know what a shock of color would be to you as someone. And, you know, I don't know exactly where you live. You don't have to tell us. But I think, you know, like blue is mm -hmm. can be a shock of color. We think of Oasis or something like that. But I guess it just depends on by on where you yeah. live. Yeah, I think right? it's just context dependent. Yeah. It's and just so a but it was just kind of funny when you said it that I, I was like, Green yeah. is not usually the thing that I think is shock of, <laughs> but. Um, so, unless you have anything else for Mars. No, we can move on. All right, so we get back <laughs> to Earth, and you know, so there's a conversation that we're gonna need to have today or, or next time about some of the characters are a little bit different 
I, I still think that Mark is pretty much Mark Watney, but there are a few characters specifically on Earth that have shifted a little bit from their characterization in the book. That being said, they're all awesome. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, Mindy, Annie, Vincent, Teddy, Bruce, long-suffering Bruce. <laughs> They're, they're all done so well. They've got, it's, it really is just sort of an all-star cast. And uh, it's, uh, whoever is the, the casting director for this movie, just I think it's bravo. Nina Gold, who, she, if, if I remember correctly, Nina Gold does like Star Wars movies. I mean, she just, I think she's based out of the UK and she does some of the biggest stuff out there. Yeah. And she, if, you know, if you enjoy Ray. Yeah. You know, she's the one who has who found all of these people from yeah. for Star Wars, and I think she's brilliant. Yeah. So, and just you know, it's not. It doesn't feel like a movie. Like these actors are all so good. It it just it feels like a bunch of people working at NASA, and they're just every one of these characters is so individualized, and they uh -huh. just even when they change them, you know, Mindy is not quite as meek at the beginning and she's not quite as strong at the end. Yeah. She's a little more of just sort of uh, kind of meek and snarky throughout the whole film. But even then, I feel like she still is Mindy. You know, like they, they captured the spirit of most of these characters really well, even if it's sort of an alternative universe Mindy. I disagree on the Mindy front. I think, I mean, I think the actress does a great job. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that they capture it because there's no point at which she talks back to her superiors, which is absolutely what happens mm -hmm. in the book. And I don't mean in like a getting really angry or bitchy sort of way. No, no. But just pushing back. Pushing back or, you know, kind of telling her truth about being paparazzi, you mm -hmm. know, that sort of thing. And I enjoyed that and she you know there's a point at which she could push back we get we get a moment later in the movie between her and Venkat yeah. and she just agrees with him because she's supposed to because he's her boss yeah and I was just like dang it they had the opportunity to let her let her be this fully fleshed out character and yeah. they held her back and that bummed me out yeah um but we also get you know we get Sean Bean and Bean is awesome. he's Mitch, angry, angry Mitch. Except, and this is one of those things that I, I, I would argue that Mitch is probably the biggest departure from book to movie. Because Mitch in the book is a just a bull in a china shop. He is, he is <laughs> alienating everyone. He is stubborn. He is angry. He is like, you know, they go to, they go to China and there may have been an eyeball in the soup because they hate you. Like he just... Nobody likes Mitch because he's so just pig-headed and just, yeah. And, man, I have never seen Sean Bean play a character this meek before. He is just, every scene, he's drawn in and his shoulders are kind of hunched and he's just, he's very soft-spoken. And even even when he is putting his foot down, he's kind of... Uh, He's, it's like he's kind of bad at it. You know, yeah. there's, there's a moment where uh, Teddy says, uh, you're saying this because Vincent isn't here to defend himself. And Sean Bean's delivery is like, I, I shouldn't have to argue with Vincent. Like, he, like he's kind of petulant You know what? It. But that's kind, of, that's kind of the Sean Bean thing. Because, like, if you think of Game of Thrones, he gets pulled back to King's Landing specifically because he's asked to. And his wife is sitting there going, uh, please don't. Like, let's not do this. And he's like, well... Uh, I have to it's uh, for well, the he's, kingdom. Well, he's usually sort of the honorable man. You know, he's he's the he's the you know, but again, a, Boromir in Lord of the Rings. He's he's all, he's never, you know, sort of angry, but he's usually he just sort of projects a little more. He he's he's more of a leader, more of an authority figure, a little more like Teddy in this movie, frankly. Whereas well, this character is very soft-spoken and just kinda, I mean, I guess to me it feels like a different facet of some of something that he plays relatively frequently which is kind of the, the quiet, think, like, thinks before he speaks sort of, sort of character. Yes. And I just, I think that the, the main difference is most of Sean Bean's characters choose to be that way, mm -hmm. whereas I get the sense that Mitch from The Martian, the film, he's the kind of guy who wishes that he could speak up more. Right. Like, he, he seems like the kind of guy who kind of hates how quiet he is and gets mad at himself for, I should have said that in, the, in that meeting, yeah, I mean, I guess it'd probably be really hard for the director to pit 
Sean Bean against Jeff Daniels and not just have every one of those scenes be a shouting match. Yeah. You probably ha- you have to give different levels, yeah. which one of the things about reading a book is that you are already you are automatically doing it. That yeah. your brain your brain pitches you ideas on how each character uh, sounds like the the tone of voice and and the emotional range and all of that and so but a movie takes away all of that imagination and gives it to you on a platter so the director has to decide who has the power each time Mm -hmm. and who gets to hold all of the energy yeah and actors you know you have to go with it you have and and oftentimes you kind of figure it out and jeff daniels is going to hold yeah. all of the power i do wonder if this was a choice of sean beans or if this was a, 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 a choice of the directors or you know like where in the process was it decided that mitch was going to be quiet instead of loud and angry right you know, right right that would be an interesting thing to ask someone yeah um, um we get uh we get this moment here where they um we've got let's see here if the Venkat, right? Vincent. Yeah. Uh, yes. He talks about how, I-, I think it's him, right, that says, you know, we we have to get the money now for all of this because people forget, you know, we can't ask for money from Congress in a year. Mm-hmm. We need it now. Like, he's, it's when he's asking for satellite images. Yeah. And Teddy's like, uh, no, we're not going to get satellite images of, of Mark's, Mark's body, body but, yeah. right? And I, it's one of those moments that is just kind of horrifyingly true mm-hmm. in this movie where we we get Venkats saying, like, hey, uh, this, this, th- this major thing in human history is going to pass us by. Like, we should at least use it while we have it. Because humans are so desensitized, things are changing so quickly. Mm-hmm. It's not like we're living in the 1600s and a thing happens and that's all anybody talks about for an entire year. Right. That's not the world we live in. As we can see by current events, like mm-hmm. uh, the number people would roll out lists of like, oh, this guy said all of these horrible things in the past couple of years. And you're like, holy shit, I forgot about all of these mm-hmm. because... It's it already moves moved so up, yeah. And so I was, it was one of those things that when I watched it, I was just like, oh, God. That is a compelling argument about mm-hmm. how quickly people stop giving a shit, and it makes me really sad. Yeah. And it's not like we can hold it all in. Like, we can't hold everything at all times. We can't be emotional about everything at all times. Like, mm-hmm. we have a limit. It makes sense, but it's also it's simultaneously really sad. I thought it was great. It, yeah. was, it was a poignant moment. For sure. Um, one thing that is worth mentioning, by the way, is we have changed Venkat's race. Yep. Uh, as, as you just indicated, the character from the book is Venkat Kapoor. The character in the book is Vincent, Vincent Kapoor because uh, they yeah. did not cast an Indian character. Yes. And, um, I'm they gonna did, have a hard time not calling that. him Venkat the entire time. Yeah. So bear with me because. Yeah. Um, and notably they did keep part of his heritage. He, he does mention in, toward the, second half of the film he mentions that i think his mother was hindu and his father was baptist yeah yeah yeah. and so it explains okay clearly this guy has has an indian parent and mm-hmm. a and a black parent chuatella jufor is perfect in this movie yeah, as he is in most movies so i i don't i doubt anyone can fault him but it is interesting that they changed his race and this might be on me but the first time i read this book mindy park was asian in my head I don't know I don't if remember. that was the intention, but yeah. Um, I mean, as we all know, she's just Mindy, what's her name from The Office in my head, so <laughs> Fair. she's Indian. Um, so pretty quickly, we move up to trying to figure out where is Mark going in the rover. Yeah. And they have this great moment, just like they do in the book, where he, where uh, Vincent figures out where he's going using the map in the uh, in the cafeteria. And it's fun. And it's fun. It's so much fun. Uh, and he does a good job, by the way, of sidestepping the tired old movie trope of not telling his scene partner what he's thinking until the grand reveal. That's something movies often do, and it's often a little cliche. But he does a really good job of portraying, like, no, he's he's thinking. It's not that he's, like, waiting for the grand reveal. Oh, it's see, that he kind of can't talk. About it. He's... he's 
busy looking for a map and like where where is this i see uh, to me it still felt like it was part of that cliche poor communication is a way that directors mm -hmm. like ratchet up tension yeah and for all the great communicators out there it's like really frustrating but let's be honest if everybody on screen always had good communication we would not get decent stories um we would just get happiness all the time on screen and how boring is that um but I, I, you know, to me, it's it's one of those yeah. things again where, sure, he might be thinking, but you you still, people often still try to communicate even if they're poorly doing. Oh, it. I agree. He could have communicated it. What I'm saying is the actor I thought did a really good job of portraying someone who was so busy trying to remember the exact topography of this region on Mars that he sort of couldn't. Uh, bring himself to talk, you know, like he, there were even some lines along the way that he sort of didn't finish the sentence because he was trying to think through this and and he, he just kept saying to himself, yeah, I know where he's going. Uh, uh, I know where he's going. And so he finally reveals it. I say there's a, there needs to be a shout out to the editor um, with this Pathfinder part. Yes. Because I love that we see, we don't know what it, uh, most of us aren't going to know what it is when he goes to when they go to JPL and they take the tarp off of the replica of of Pathfinder, and and meanwhile Mark is, is digging through the dust yes. looking for he picks up a parachute and he sort of follows the line uh -huh. forward. And then what we end up seeing is we see the closed up pristine version of Pathfinder, and then we cut back to Mars and we see it all laid out, mm -hmm. and we see it in a different position, and it's not as um it's not pristine right mm -hmm. and so we get to see it in it's two different like in these two different phases or mm -hmm. stages and I, I don't know i thought it was a it was super lovely because we i i think that it's a great way of communicating without telling us exactly what's happening mm -hmm. these are the same items which they do mm -hmm. say but it's it would have been something easy to miss and getting to see that it was like the flower in its open stage you know mm -hmm. and i don't know there's just something well, really pretty about it there's also a very beautiful moment from sort of a filmmaking and storytelling standpoint finding pathfinder is one of my favorite moments in any movie and it's kind of goofy to say because it's not that big a moment you know um it's not like you know everybody's showing up at the end of avengers endgame or anything but it's really beautiful the way the m the music and the editing and these two characters come together and the thing that is especially interesting from sort of a subliminal standpoint is Pathfinder is how Mark is going to communicate to Earth. And discovering Pathfinder is the first moment of connection that he has with someone on Earth. He and Venkat, he and Vincent, are sharing this moment. And it's probably not happening at exactly the same moment in real life, but in the story, in the editing of the film, He's uncovering this machine, Vincent uncovers this machine, and then he gazes at it and says, Pathfinder. And then it cuts to Vincent gazing at it and he says, Pathfinder. And it's this great moment of, it's like Mars and Earth have finally been bridged. Vincent and Mark are connected. They just haven't sort of realized it yet. Yeah. They are sharing a moment, even though they haven't gotten the radio working. And it's, uh, it's just beautiful storytelling. We also get Nate the Great here. We get Nate the Great. And if you guys haven't seen Teddy Lasso, Ted or Lasso. Ted Lasso, I don't know why. Why did I just, whatever, care? who cares? Uh, if you haven't seen it, just go watch it. Find it's a way. I, it's phenomenal. And there's a character in it called Nate the Great. Yep. And, and that, that actor plays Tim. He does play Tim, who, not because of the actor, I mean, probably a little bit, but it's, again, the difference between your imagination and then seeing someone else do their version of mm -hmm. the same thing. And it's a lot easier in your imagination to give um, a little bit of charm to someone who ne wasn't necessarily written that way or supposed to be. Like, it, it's easier to find someone charming that is obnoxious. And, and like, I mean, uh, an example of this is, okay, there's Tim, who is is an asshole. Yeah. And then you've got House, and you get to see so much of, and obviously not in this movie, House, like the TV show. You get 
so much of his character mm -hmm. that if you only got a slice of it, you'd be like, this guy is just an asshole. Yeah. But you get to see the charming, funny parts of him too, even yeah. though he's still kind of being an asshole almost the entire time. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're just, just getting a slice of Tim and you don't get to see as much of him as you do in the book and you don't get like the kind of funny lines. Mm -hmm. So it's not entirely on the actor. Yeah. Again, it has a lot to do with what you can do with your imagination that can't be put yeah. out on screen. Well, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he has one line in the entire movie. I think the only thing that Nate says, aside from like, we're getting a signal, I think the only real line he has is when he says, uh, you know, 26 minute round trip, this isn't gonna be an Algonquin round table of snappy repartee. Yeah. And then Vincent snaps at him and then we just move on. So there is like, that's, yeah, he, we don't get enough time he to does see a anything. a good accent though. Yep. That is true. Um, yeah. So um, I say so. We are coming up on the hexadecimal sequence, which is probably going to have a fair bit of commentary. So I, I just, as, as part of that, um, I mean, yes, we do. Mm -hmm. um, we could, we could pause now. Yeah. Do you want to? I think that's probably a good stopping place. By okay. my by my notes, we've gone about a third of the way <laughs> through the movie. You guys were so bad at this. We, okay. Yeah. Listen. We have words. We have we, lots of words. We, have lots we of words. really we really enjoy stories, and we have a hard time not discussing every single detail. Uh, Believe we it or not, this is us rushing. Yeah. Like we were skipping notes here to to keep the time down. So we're still working on our pacing. Yeah. We will get there. So next time we'll see, we'll see if we just go through more of the movie yeah. or if we do a little bit more of the deep dive stuff that we've talked about, because I want to get to that. Yes. Um, because we're from the film industry and this mm -hmm. is like, he went to film school and I am a theater kid. There's so much that yeah. we can talk about that is not just um, the science exactly mm. so i i think it's worth yeah worth using doing, doing using what dive. we have let's use our degrees man yeah because <laughs> we don't imagine actually, that yeah uh, we paid a lot for them so uh those of you who are watching this or listening to this in the future you can probably look at the episode <laughs> list and see the 17 part series that is Lacey and Alex talk about the Martian, the film. We will do better. We are maybe not on this movie though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was, so I was going to say at this rate, it's probably going to be three episodes, but I feel like that's a trap because yeah. inevitably it's going to be nine. We're just not. So gonna. we're just going to say tune in next week for the next installment of the Martian, the film here on the synthesis. If you have questions about anything, film industry-wise or whatever, yes, uh, shout it out to us. We will find it. Um, Iman, economist, I'm sorry I got what part of Australia you are oh. from incorrect. Um, I, I cannot say that I know Australian uh, geography very well, and that was noted. Yep. Um, so <laughs> but yes, if you have any questions, if you have anything you want us to talk about uh, in terms of filmmaking, in terms of adapting the book, in terms of science, uh, post in the comments and let us know and we yeah. will try to address it in the and future. Yeah, we can do we can do a little bit of research. Yeah. Why, why make you do it? Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you all guys. Right. Have a good weekend. Oh, uh, subscribe. Do all of the things. Yep. What subscribe, are they supposed to do? Subscribe and hit the bell if you're watching us on YouTube. And uh, be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Edgeworks Entertainment, which helps us make this show and everything else we yes, do at Edgeworks. And, uh, you know, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Yeah. So Alexander for the win or yeah. Alex for the win. I'm sorry. Alex for the win on Twitter. And I'm just plain old Lacey Hannon. Or you can find us. Settle the stars. Or Edgeworks Entertainment, or Edgeworks. We have lots Ent. of handles. We're all we've gotta over make the place. this. We gotta make this We're a little everywhere. bit more streamlined. It's true. Easier, whatever. We'll all see right. you guys next week. Thanks for watching.